Good morning, everybody. Um, it's good to see all of you. It is my honor to uh, introduce Dr. Nicole A. Cook. Um, Nicole and I actually shared a cab in Boston to the airport after a conference, and um, she is just a, a gracious, warm person, and I'm super excited to welcome her. Let me, I'll go through the official thing, but um, I'm excited, so. Um, Dr. Cook is the is an associate professor and the MS LIS program director at the School of Information Sciences at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. She holds a master's of, um, master's of education in adult education from Pennsylvania State University and an MLS and PhD in communication, information, and library studies from Rutgers University. Uh, her research and teaching interests include human information behavior, critical cultural information studies, and diversity and social justice in librarianship. She has a list of awards and academic honors. I would just like to highlight a couple here. Uh, she was a mover and shaker uh, from Library Journal in 2007. She's a recipient of the American Library Association's um, Equality Award in 2016. And um, she received the Achievement in Library Diversity Research Award from ALA's Office for Diversity, Literacy, and Outreach in 2017. Of course, she has a whole list of honors, but things you should not miss, or a whole list of, uh, list of publications, but do not miss um, her latest works, Information Services to Diverse Populations from Libraries Unlimited, and Fake News and Alternative Facts, Information Literacy in a Post-Truth post Era from ALA. Um, it is great for, um, I, we welcome everyone from out of state. For those of us, the Illinoisians who are here, having someone who is here in our state that is a national voice um, on issues, especially with the fake news, um, the misinformation that's out there, someone who's really leading the way in helping librarians and educators think about how we should be thinking about curriculum, instruction, information literacy. Um, it's a vital time. So with that, um, welcome, Nicole. Thank you, everybody. Good morning. So I'm glad Troy didn't actually call my mother for that introduction, to get because we'd still be here. Um, thank you to Troy and Tish and the organizing committee for uh, the invitation to be here with you all today. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, the dark side of information, if you will. So at the University of Illinois, I teach a class called Use and Users of Information. And it's really just information behavior, how people interact with information. And I usually say it's how people use, seek, and avoid information. And so this whole fake news, misinformation, disinformation phenomenon, I look at it, look at it as a form, as part of information behavior. And so specifically when I'm talking about the dark side, if you will, I want to talk a little bit about emotions and how people uh, kind of physically and viscerally re react to information. And so maybe the question is, you know, why are we really interested in people's emotions? We're just here to give the facts. Um, but think about it as a larger context and thinking about the humanity of our users. Right, so we're all uh, teachers, we're all in the classroom, we're all trying to do our level best to impart information. And we have all had those sessions, and I should say that I was an instruction librarian for over 10 years, so I, I know what this is about. We've all had those sessions where you get those blank stares, and they walk away and they haven't heard a thing you said. Right, and so I don't know about you, but there were many days where I took that personally and said I'm never gonna give another instruction session again. Um, but part of this, you know, there's a lot more context, right, because we're dealing with human beings. So thinking about just the whole ecosystem of information literacy and what role uh, emotion plays in that ecosystem. So we're now living in an age of fake news, which is but one manifestation of misinformation and disinformation, which I will hear and refer to as misdis. Uh, and human information behavior. So fake news is not a new phenomenon, but this latest iteration has highlighted the affective or emotional dimensions of how people interact with information. Information consumption is so much more than people's cognitive processing. Emotional reactions to information are what in part give fake news its tenacity and why it's in part so hard to address. So even though we may know better cognitively, 
we are all susceptible to mystis and fake news because of these emotional reactions that we have. And so even though our heads tell us one thing, our guts and our hearts may tell us something different, right? So just as a very quick example, if I trust Troy, I might be more willing to accept information from him, even if he's trying to swindle me, right? Now, on the other hand, if I distrust Susan, Susan could be giving me the gospel truth and I'm not gonna accept it because I don't trust her, all right? So these are all emotional reactions. So as part of that emotional state, it is now being called post-truth, all right? And I'll come back to post-truth in just a minute. But post-truth is really referring to that gut reaction, right? That emotional reaction and knee-jerk reaction, however you want to think of it. Um, and, and that's our immediate interaction. And sometimes we can get past that immediate reaction and sometimes we don't. Right, and so part of that is what we do in our information literacy instruction sessions is try to get people, our students, our patrons, et cetera, to move past these initial reactions and really use those critical thinking skills, right? Sometimes it's successful, sometimes it's not, right? It just depends on the strength of that emotional reaction. So when we're thinking about misdis or misinformation and disinformation, so misinformation is, if we just want to define it simply, just talking about information that is false, right? It doesn't matter why it's false, it just is, right? But the catch with misinformation and disinformation is the speed at which the information is shared and passed along, right? And that's part of the reason fake news is so hard to combat because by the time I click share, a thousand people could see this erroneous information. Right? And even if I were to put out a retraction, the same thousand people might not see it or they may have moved on because we are so inundated with information, our attention spans aren't long enough to say, you know, I should go back you know, and, and really read this retraction, et cetera. Right? And you know, we also have this phenomenon of people sharing, especially on social media, people are clicking and sharing on things that they don't even read. Right? And again, we get to this trust, distrust factor. If I trust you and you shared it, why wouldn't I share it, right? So it may be wrong, it may be misinformation, but I trust the person, it's already sent out, okay? So according to Merriam-Webster, uh, the first known use of misinformation was 1605, all right? And there are also uh, New York Times and other articles uh, with fake news as early as 1901. All right, so again, none of this is new. It's just a new iteration. Um, and because of the particular climate that we live in, it has a really um, tenacious hold, right? And, and now moves, means other things, but that, that's a whole other talk. So if we talk about disinformation, disinformation is also information that is false, but it's purposely false, right? So think about that game telephone, and I'm probably dating myself. Um, but if I were to start with this table and purposely make something up and the message carries around the room, not only is the information going to be different, um, it could be malicious, it could be designed to deceive, trick, etc. All right, so when we have disinformation on the internet and on social media, etc., it's the same thing as with misinformation, it's just this information is intended to harm. Right? And that's not always evident, okay? So with disinformation and thinking about fake news, um, one of the things that really surprised me when we started talking about fake news again were some of the exposés and profiles that there are actually fake news farms and people are sitting in cubicles and that is their job, is to sit there and type up information, just make stuff up, right? And because it's all about clicks and hits and earning money. Right? So that is what we call or refer to as political economy. Right? So they have no incentive to stop with the misinformation and disinformation because this is actually how people make their money. Okay. So in terms of disinformation, uh, Merriam-Webster says that um, the first known use was in 1939. All right? So again, not new. Um, think about how we go through history with propaganda and yellow journalism um, and just plain fabrication. Okay. 
There is a third category called mal information, M-A-L information. And this is similar to disinformation uh, in the sense that it is purposely created uh, to harm or to, to deceive. But malinformation is even more insidious because this would be uh, something that could actually be criminal or it could be deadly or it could be um, any of really uh, bad information in the sense of think of revenge porn or doxing uh, when people's identities are stolen. That would be considered malinformation. So these are the things that we're dealing with, right? And we're inundated with misinformation, disinformation, malinformation, in addition to all of the other information that we face and are, that we encounter on a daily basis. So the information environment is affect driven, all right? So affective or emotionally driven. And so, when we are processing information, we process information cognitively, all right? So how do we mentally process the information that we're, uh, we're encountering, all right? That's probably what we, we are thinking about when we are in our classrooms. How are the students or the patrons actually cognitively processing uh, what we're telling them? People also encounter information physiologically. All right, so think about again, you know, the knee jerk reaction, trust your gut, or information that might give you goosebumps or might make the hair on the back of your neck stand up. All of this is physiological interactions with information. And there's a great deal of information that we um, encounter just through our bodies and that we uh, absorb and put out on a daily basis that we're not even aware of, but we do process information physiologically as well. So the third one, and that's where I spend most of my time, is that we process information emotionally. All right, again, that kind of idea of post-truth, and I'm really just leading with my gut when I'm looking and absorbing some of this information. So with that said, it is often, uh, right now it's called uh, post-truth, often referred to as that. And this idea, again, that we are uh, emotionally reactive to information and to the point where it could actually override reasoning, uh, critical thinking, all of the things that we spend a lot of time thinking about. So just like the other terms that I've mentioned to you, post-truth is also not new. Our friend, he's probably an honorary librarian at this point um, because so many people use him in their classes. Uh, Stephen Colbert told us about truthiness over a decade ago. All right, so we're dealing with the same things, right? Just with new names. So post-truth and truthiness emphasize the fact that there are a wide range of motivations and emotions uh, that underlie our everyday information seeking, information selection, information avoidance, and our actual information usage. And so this is all part of the information behavior process. So information behavior is all about context. Information or facts do not exist in a vacuum. Rather, they are surrounded and shaped by context of all kinds, both internal and external. So I hope you can see part of this. Um, I know it's a little bit small, but it looks okay on the screen. So when we're thinking about emotions, this is one of many information typologies, or excuse me, emotion typologies that you could find online. And so there's a lot, a lot of literature and whole fields and disciplines uh, that really dedicate their time to emotions and decision making and things of that nature. And so I wanted to give you a visual of this and just read off some of the many emotions that we deal with that we may not even be cognizant of. So if we're, if we're going to classify emotions I'll just use positive and negative today, but understand that these are all on the spectrum and they're all very nuanced, et cetera. So if I'm feeling positive emotion, that could be sympathy. It could be kindness. It could be respect. It could be love, admiration, desire, joy, euphoria, amusement, hope, energy, anticipation, surprise. Now, if I go to the other end, negative, this could be anger, resentment, contempt, hate, disgust. It could even be boredom, 
right? A lot happens when we're bored. Sadness, disappointment, loneliness, all right? We, maybe you've heard of some of the studies, especially with folks on Twitter and Facebook, how social media increases loneliness, right? And then that becomes another type of catch-22, if you will. Jealousy, shame, anxiety, and distrust. All right, so you could be feeling any of those emotions, right? So let's just say today at 9.31, I'm feeling euphoric, I'm feeling good. And I receive a piece of information and I interpret it in a particular way. Now at 3.45, maybe I'm cranky, maybe I'm tired, whatever it may be, you could give me the same piece of information and I could interpret it totally differently because now I have a new filter happening. All right, so when we're thinking about you know, doing our uh, instruction and our, our teaching um, and we're dealing with so many different people and so many different emotions and we've all had sessions where they didn't go quite the way we wanted them to because we didn't feel a particular way that day. All right, so all of this is part of that context of not only under, uh, understanding our patrons, but also understanding ourselves. So some of the ways that this manifests. All right, we've all done it, I've done it. Um, you go on Google, you get 33,211 hits, and you pick the first one, all right? So, Couple different reasons for some of this in terms of the misinformation phenomenon, fake news phenomenon. We have confirmation bias, all right? So that means that I am looking for information and will readily accept information that confirms what I already believe, whether it's right or wrong, right? So, you know, you hit that link, see, it's not just me. Everybody else believes this too. Confirmation bias. Filter bubbles which uh, are also referred to as echo chambers, right? So our social media uh, can be so carefully curated. You can go days without actually encountering anyone who has an opinion different than yours, right? Now, sometimes that could be self-preservation. Other times it could be, you know, you're, you're missing information. And you know, I've had students say, well, is that a bad thing that I'm missing information? It might not be, but the key is that you need to know you're missing information. And this idea that maybe other people think differently or have other opinions, whether you agree with them or not. All right, so the filter bubbles or the echo chambers, not necessarily dangerous, you just have to know that you're in them, okay? Information overload. We are so inundated with information we have uh, mental filters, uh, schemas, uh, by which we decide what we're gonna wear, what route we're gonna take, what we're gonna eat today. Some of this is implicit, some of this is explicit, right? So we're just constantly inundated with information. And with these mental frameworks that we have, there's an inordinate amount of information that we avoid or dismiss and we may not even really be aware of it, right? Because there's no real way that we could consciously and cognitively and emotionally process all of the information that we're subject to on a daily basis. All right, two more here. Satisficing, this uh, is very much related to the graphic as well. Satisficing is this idea of it's good enough, all right? So I know we see a lot of that in our uh, instruction classrooms. You tell someone, uh, well, I need three examples of whatever this concept is, and they pick the first three. Right, it's good enough, I just wanna answer the question. Okay, so that's satisficing. And the, the last one is very similar to information overload. It's the idea of uh, information avoidance, right? So again, you could be overloaded with information or it could just be regular information that I decide I don't wanna be bothered with. So that is a more uh, explicit decision on your part. All right, so if Tish says something to me and you know, whatever's happening, I can just say, I'm, I'm actually avoiding this information. I'm just going to choose not to interact with it, okay? And so all of these are happening with the information that we're inundated with, uh, and sometimes this is happening, we see this happening with fake news, right? So as part of that information that we pick the top three just because it's good enough, we could be picking fake news, right? And because of the information overload, 
the information avoidance, the filter bubbles, et cetera, we might not actually be realizing that it's fake news, misinformation, disinformation that we're choosing to interact with. So with all of that said, I want to move slightly into, um, or move into what I'm calling misinformation behavior. So this is part of the process, um, at least how I'm looking at it in terms of how we're dealing with information and how we're trying to process it, or maybe we're not trying to process it, right? So if we start with fake news and we talk about misinformation, disinformation, malinformation. The next step on this spectrum, or it could actually be a cycle, if you will, uh, the next is emotion. How are we affectively or emotionally processing this information? If we get past the emotional part, how are we actually evaluating this information? Right, And that's part of the cognitive information processing. And then ultimately, it, we go into information use. All right, so if we're talking in our uh, classrooms and we're talking about all of these different things and how people should be thinking critically and using all of the steps to evaluate the information and select peer-reviewed articles and all of the things that we talk about, that's really in the realm of evaluation and information use. If we can't get them past the emotional, they may not get to the evaluation or information use. All right, so this is why, you know, sometimes, at least when I do presentations, I'll have people tell me, well, you can't use any political examples. And don't worry, I'm not going there this morning. But if people have visceral reactions to one person or another, you may not even hear me enough to get to the evaluation or information use because you're stuck in the emotional factor of, I don't like this person, I don't trust this person. I don't like their policies, or you know, whatever the reaction is. Okay. So let me give you a few examples, right? So if we're going to come back to this idea of emotion, right? That's kind of that wild card. And it really can determine if and how we use information. And so we as content producers or uh, conveyors of information, we don't really have that much control over other people's emotions, right? But we do need to know that perhaps that is what's happening. And it might even be a, a strategy to mention it, to say, this might make you mad, but you need to know about it anyway, all right? This might not be fun, but you need to do it for the end of the semester project. Right, so it might just even be a, a, a very cognizant acknowledgement that might help us get over you know, some of this misinformation and disinformation. So I'll give you, again, a couple of examples. So is the information that you're giving me, does it make me happy or does it amuse me? Right? Does it hit one of those emotions that I read from the positive side? If it does, I might be more inclined to believe you. If the information that you give me makes me happy or amuses me, and this is consistent, that might actually contribute to me trusting you. Right? So again, we, as uh, instructors and teachers, we know a lot about developing trust and rapport with our students and our patrons. Right? So part of that trust is whether or not they're going to accept the information that, that you give them. All right? The information that you are giving them, does it make me feel neutral or indifferent? Right? And that could have opposite effects. Right? It just depends on the person. So in this world of information overload, am I looking for something that's neutral that I don't have to pick a side or I don't have to feel a particular way about? If that's what I'm looking for, because that's the particular emotional state that I'm in, I might actually gravitate. To, to that information. But if we're having a discussion of privilege, power, oppression, and all of those other hard topics, and you take a neutral stance, I might actually reject your information because I feel like you're not taking the topic seriously in the way that I do. All right? So all of it, it depends on who you're talking to, when you're talking to them, and how they feel about you or a particular topic.
So eliciting other emotions. All right, so before I talk about this, does anyone know who this is in the slide? Okay, so just a few people. So this is an actress named Selma Blair. Um, and she used to be in some of like the, the teen movies and, and other things of that nature. So at the recent Academy Awards, she came to one of the parties in this beautiful, colorful dress. And if you can see in her hand, she's walking with a cane. So she recently revealed that she is suffering from multiple sclerosis and it's really uh, taking its toll on her physical being. And so I'm not a particular fan of her work, right? No, you know, uh, no uh, disparagement of her work. Um, but when I saw this picture, right, so I'm looking at the picture and I see the color and it's striking and I'm wondering, I have curiosity now, what's with this cane? Right, so I read the story and then subsequently, because you know how the, the media types do, she had a, um, a segment on Good Morning America and I cried, right, so she really got me, she got the emotions. And so now because I have an emotional investment, I'm still not gonna watch her movies. <laughs> but I will follow her on social media to see how she's doing, right? So now I have an emotional investment. So I give this example to say that we could have emotional reactions in very unexpected ways, right? So you never know if a joke is gonna land. You never know if a particular piece of information is gonna land. You don't know if they, maybe they just don't like EBSCO that day. They don't like that interface. <laughs> Right, it's like all of it's a little bit of a crapshoot, right? So, but to know that there are going to be some unexpected moments that really draw people in, right? And then there's information that I just don't want to hear for whatever reason, right? And so I've seen adults do this, not just the kids, <laughs> right? So if you're giving me information that I just don't want to hear, and this could be whether I trust you or I distrust you, I could just avoid the information. I'm just not, I'm choosing not to deal with it. All right, we've all had those students too. All right, so I told a small fib. I'm gonna use a very simple example. <laughs> so the reason that I use this particular example is I wanna talk about another dimension of the fake news, misinformation, and disinformation. And have people heard of deep fakes? Okay, so this idea that the technology is in getting increasingly sophisticated to the point where it's very hard to tell uh, what's real, what's fake, et cetera. So now how this is tied to emotion. If you have particular feelings about former President Obama, this could go different ways. Now if I love Obama, I'll listen to anything he says and I'm not gonna question it. Right, so I'm not saying don't question the information if you trust someone, right? But depending on people's emotional reaction, they may not question what he's saying. So in this particular video, I hope you've seen it. If you haven't, I would encourage you to look it up. Uh, it's by uh, Jordan Peele, and he created this public service announcement specifically about deep fakes. And so Jordan Peele is very talented and does a mean impression of President Obama. So when you're listening to this video, you hear Obama's voice and you're like, okay, yeah, all right. And you're not really paying attention to the fact that Jordan is saying some really outrageous things. So if you have someone who doesn't like President Obama and they hear some of the nonsense that Jordan was saying, because they have a negative reaction to him, they might be inclined to believe what they saw and what they heard, all right? Now along with all of the technology for deep fakes. We have uh, fake status generators. We have fake tweet generators, right? I saw an example of an academic not too long ago, um, and she was talking about uh, rape culture and you know fighting back against that. And evidently, she, maybe a year or two ago, she had made some offhanded comment on Twitter about Taylor Swift. So. They tell me they're called Swifties. So the Swifties have been harassing her since she made this comment about Taylor Swift. And so what they wound up doing was photoshopping her picture, the, the woman on Twitter, um, and, and 
just saying the most hateful, contradictory things. And people were believing that these were actual tweets because the woman's picture was there. Right? So then we're talking about visual cues and visual recognition, et cetera. And so, you know, I say all this to say that when people were discussing this scenario, they were saying, well, you could go into Photoshop and you could change the code and you could do this and you could do that. And I'm thinking, or you could just go to faketweet.com and upload someone's picture and type in what you want. All right, so again, this is part of this information overload. If I'm so inundated, especially on social media, if I see the picture of the same person that I see all the time, I'm not necessarily taking the time to recognize that this sounds different from how this person normally presents or speaks. Okay. So, when we're thinking about misinformation, disinformation, fake news, et cetera, um, just to give you a couple of uh, thoughts about the challenges of addressing this in our work, and some of the implications. So some of the challenges are a lack of standard definitions. All right, so I gave you some definitions from uh, Merriam-Webster and things of that nature, um, but fake news now means something different uh, because a certain person keeps using it and uses it in a particular way. All right, so fake news, I actually want us to move away from fake news because it has become very partisan and politicized. And talk about misinformation and disinformation. And I feel like it's easier uh, for us to have standard definitions of those terms. Lack of historical context, all right? This idea that a lot of people think fake news is new. It is not, has a very, very long history. Um, when we talk about things like fake news and just use that phrase, it allows us to talk about things in isolation when we really need to be talking about things broadly and in greater context. Fake news is now being used as a judgment or an opinion, as opposed to really uh, moving back and talking about uh, misinformation and disinformation. I mentioned political economy to you earlier, this idea that misinformation and disinformation um, are jobs for people, right? And then that takes on a whole other dimension. And this, I think, is a lot of what we see, this illusion of technical skills. Like, we have a lot of students, um, they used to be called digital natives, the literature is telling us we don't want to call them that anymore, but that's another talk. But we have a lot of folks thinking that because they can use Facebook or Photoshop, that they are technically proficient in everything, right? And that they would never be susceptible to misinformation and disinformation. So our implications uh, as teachers and educators and information professionals, um, this is what we do whether we call it misinformation or disinformation, um, our, you know, our, our long-term goal has been to impart critical thinking and, and teach people how to effectively interact with information. And I don't know if any of you have read uh, the work of um, Trudy Jacobson and Tom Mackey. They are talking about meta-literacy, and they are now on their third book through ALA. And so they really have a nice approach in terms of, we talk a lot about information literacy. Um, at my school, I have someone else that talks about visual literacy. I have another colleague who talks about media literacy. I have someone else who talks about computer literacy. And they're, they're working in silos, right? And we're all talking about the same thing, we just have different names. So Tom and Trudy are really talking about meta-literacy, looking at the commonalities of all of the types of literacies that we need just for information. All right, so I would recommend their work as well. And you know, we can be talking about the implications of misinformation and disinformation for our pedagogy, right? That's a whole other uh, discussion and thought process. Cultural literacy. I know that you all have seen the memes and the tweets and the things that really uh, do damage because they perpetuate stereotypes and microaggressions and things of that nature. So when you see something that goes viral, not only is it misinformation or disinformation, what other stereotype or negative implication is it promoting? All right, so thinking about, again, in context. All right, and we see a lot of uh, misinformation and disinformation in health information. All right, so that's a whole other dimension of um, thinking about how we interact with people and, and how we help people interact with information. Um, a lot of information avoidance if you're dealing with a health issue. 
or maybe you're going to just absorb all of the misinformation and disinformation when you have a condition because you're desperate for something to work, right? So a whole other dimension to that as well. All right, and then the last thing I'll leave you with is when we're doing this work, think about what the other disciplines are doing. Psychology, sociology, journalism, communication, et cetera. We're all doing the same work. We're just calling it different things. All right, I actually have a session tomorrow with uh, the journalism school at the U of I to talk about fake news and have this discussion about how we can all be on the same page. Okay. So if you would like to know more, um, this is the report that I wrote for ALA that has all of this information in it. Uh, fake news and alternative facts, information literacy in the post-truth era that was put out by ALA uh, late last year. All right. And with that, I thank you so much for your time and attention, and I think we have a few moments for questions. We have, well, we have microphones, so if you raise your hand, we will come to you. I was interested when you mentioned that if you present a um, information and you don't really have a stand on it, then your students might not be as interested in what you're saying. I was just interested to see what you think because it, there have been many articles in the Chronicle of Higher Education where professors are, are being penalized for presenting a stand on, on information to their students. Yeah, that would be me. Um, so I, I didn't mean necessarily to imply that you don't have a stand, but you may be presenting it like you don't have a stand because you don't want to persuade or sway. Um, so I have been harassed online. I've gotten wretched course evaluations. Um, and this is, I, will, I won't even say that I'm taking a particular stand in the sense that I want to convince you or bring you over to my side. I may just be saying something they don't like. So I don't mean to say don't do it. I'm just saying that sometimes if they perceive you as trying to be neutral, it could, have, it could elicit a particular response. And if they perceive you to actually be taking a stand, it could elicit a particular response, right? So um, it's, it's a rock and a hard place issue on that one for sure. <laughs> so, is there a stand? Are you work at U of I? Am I right? And yes. In the library school, are you teaching how to teach this? I mean, I, I get a ninety-minute session with English classes, and I'm supposed to teach them how to search the use mm -hmm. the database. Mm -hmm. I mean, I try to bring in as much as I can and compare it to mm -hmm. what's going on in the news or mm -hmm. some, some kind of a topic mm -hmm. that I can bring in the fake news mm -hmm. part, but. How are we supposed to get this across? This is critical thinking at its purest yeah. form. We can't get it out there. Yeah, no, I, I, I lived by the one shots. I understand that for sure. Um, I will tell you, and I don't know if it's the best approach, but I would have handouts for days. Maybe they took them, maybe they didn't. Um, it depended on the class. Um, I would have a Pinterest board where I would say, please look for additional information or have something online that they could reference later. Now, I can't say whether they did, but it's just, you know, to your point about there's only so much you can do in 90 minutes. And I, there were times I didn't even have 90 minutes. And how do you get all of that in? Um, you know, some of this for me when I did it was about just building enough rapport that they would come back. Sometimes they did, sometimes they didn't. Um, but I do teach this at the U of I and I do teach it in a class, the use and users of information class where I have turned it essentially into a misinformation and disinformation class. So in terms of preparing folks that are going to be in the classrooms with you, um, to have a few more strategies and understanding of the issue to hopefully impart, but it is, it is very difficult to get all of that in, in a one shot, for sure. Have you tried talking to the faculty more and trying to get them to buy into maybe even some cross-campus 
pictures or yeah I mean we're, we're talking about that now and that's part of the, the um, part of the goal of these interdisciplinary conversations because again everybody's talking about it but they're saying they're calling it different things right so when I and you've probably encountered this when I say information literacy on my campus they're like what and I'm like critical thinking they're like oh yeah Right, so what are the common terms? And then once we all get on the same page, how can we you know, uh, work together to be better ambassadors for this? Yeah, I know um, just a comment to that as well. And at our institution, we've been looking um, across disciplines for ways to make that engagement. So we have a media literacy course in our college of communication that we have um, gotten involved with where we do a fake news um, session and uh, so I think those are wonderful opportunities. Journalism, yeah. um, that field as well. We're lucky because um, this class is also part of a core curriculum uh, requirement opportunity mm -hmm. for outside majors out mm -hmm. of CECOM. So uh, we're hopefully hitting some of those yeah. as students as well. So I think that's a really good strategy too, is find those courses within other disciplines that you can connect with. Yeah, absolutely, and I think the, um, not to use the word repetition, but I think the repetition is good if they're having it in one department, then they have another class and they're hearing some of the same things, that is actually a good opportunity. Hi. Um, so I deliver a similar 45 minute class on fake news misinformation to sophomores, and I give examples, and they definitely heard of fake news, they know what I'm talking about, but in the end they say, oh well, I don't fall for fake news. This doesn't apply to me. I, I'm, I'm smarter than this. Who are these people that are falling for fake news? Mm -hmm. So then how do you kind of justify and get them to understand the, in, in, the importance of this mm -hmm. and that they may in the future fall for it and I, I don't know, to, to pay attention and to think of it as something that's important information? Yeah, so, Based on this report, um, some colleagues and I did a fake news workshop uh, at the iSchool, at the, the graduate school of, um, formerly graduate school of library and information science. And so we had faculty, we had students, we had staff, we had members from the community. And there's a big chunk of that audience saying, well, I'm, I'm interested in what you have to say, but this is really not for me. And so there are several examples that I have in here. One that comes to mind readily, um, I find, I have found that the visual um, examples work a little bit better. So, and I'm sorry I don't have it uh, at the ready or I would show you. We had a picture of a couple that were on the ground and it looked like they were in an embrace and there were, you know, um, SWAT team and police and things in the back. And so you ask them, you know, what's happening here? And every time I've done it, unless they already know the story, they'll say, it looks like they're being inappropriate while there's a riot going on behind them. So then I pull up all of the news accounts, I pull up different videos. Um, they were coming out of a Canadian hockey game and I guess the opposing team, the visiting team won and the fans actually rioted in the street. And so what we see of this couple on the ground is they had been trampled by the, the crowd. And so he was actually trying, she was unconscious, and she, he was actually trying to revive her and pull her out of the way. So part of this is you show the picture in isolation, and then you show the larger picture, and then I have two or three articles, and then I have two or three different videos because they had closed uh, the, the caption, the um, security cameras. Um, and so you could see what happened from different perspectives. And so, you know, whether or not I convince them totally, but just this idea of getting this kind of nugget in their head about everything you see, there may be more to the story, right? And just to get them to like kind of stop, go past that knee jerk reaction. Because a lot of them were very happy to say, they're being inappropriate, nothing's happened, nothing to see here, right? But when you pull back and you look at things in greater context, um, that seemed to kind of get their attention. And so, particularly when, you know, with the one shots, it may be one solid example, just enough to give them you know, some healthy skepticism. And to say, you know, and not to kind of wag your finger, you're susceptible to fake news, but just kind of enough to give them that, hmm, maybe I should think about this you know, more than the split second you know, before I click and share. 
Um, and just for reference, it's called, if you uh, look up the Vancouver Kiss Couple, um, you'll find videos and articles in the actual picture. Hey, I had a question just about um, a thing that seems to be missing in this conversation all the time for me is the way that it's not just about critical thinking, it's also advanced to a point where um, we as users of information are being manipulated subconsciously, mm -hmm. right? So the algorithms are designed to be behavior modifying um, mechanisms, right? So a lot of this is not about something that you can critically think your way through, it's about removing yourself from exposure to some of it. And I think as a field, we aren't really addressing that. You know, we're still using Pinterest and we're still using Facebook as ways to disseminate information and embedded in those networks are these behavior modification technologies mm -hmm. and, and we aren't addressing that at all. So I just think that's worth raising the question or the idea about how do we address that and where do we go with that moving forward. Well, I mean, yeah, so thank you for the question. I think it's um, that same idea of even just making the mention, right, so people are aware of it. So Tristan Harris, who used to work for Google, um, was talking about how the social media platforms and the search engines, their interface is actually designed to keep you engaged, right? So he, he likened it to uh, pulling a slot machine. Right, so you're constantly checking Gmail or your email to see if there's something there. So I agree with you about the subconscious influence, right? And, and you know, and in terms of um, removing ourselves, people are going to make a choice, you know, about that. But I think where we could fit in into that is whether we're helping them make an informed choice. Because I agree that a lot of people have no idea, right? But if we're mentioning mentioning that as part of then obviously they're going to make the choice for themselves. But I think it's part of us helping to raise that awareness. But I agree with you on that. Sure, like said, um, at the beginning of every session, I talk about browser choice. Mm -hmm. You know, and so that's yeah. your choice. Like, here's what this one does. And right. And we'll do some of the same things, like track what mm -hmm. you do. And, you know, so that's one way. Yep, yeah, absolutely. My usual context is not the one shot, but a, a longer engagement. I'm not a librarian. I'm a teaching faculty member mm -hmm. in philosophy. So I have both the privilege and the burden of working with students over the course of the whole semester. Mm -hmm. It is a privilege and it is a burden. It is. <laughs> uh, in varying right. degrees. I really appreciate your calling attention to the, the role of emotion in our engagement with uh, information. It seems like from what you've pointed out to us, there are at least two directions you could go with that. Mm -hmm. One would be to say we have to identify the emotional element so that we can cognitively disengage it, right? So that we can account for it and neutralize it. Mm -hmm. And I think of that as the typical critical thinking approach. Mm -hmm. Another approach might be to say if this emotionality of our engagement with, uh, with information is so deeply part of our humanity, how can we work on cultivating a healthy, reasonable emotionality? Mm. Not simply to try to disengage it, but to cultivate, for instance, you spoke about trust, mm -hmm. to cultivate good kinds of trust mm -hmm. with our students mm -hmm. so that they're not simply trying to identify and disengage emotion, but cultivate emotion in a way that would be productive and healthy. Your thoughts about that, please? Um, <laughs> I was just going to say, I agree. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, even to the previous question, I mean, we're, we can't control anyone's emotions but our own. And sometimes we don't even do well with that. Um, so I think it's just about as much awareness and information that we can give to be productive and constructive um, and give people options so they know whether they, they can decide whether they want to disengage or they can decide if they want to try and counteract. Right, so I, I feel like my role um, as you know, doing semester long classes is to give folks the tools and talk about the pros and cons of everything. Right, so there is some critical thinking involved, but at the end of the day, they're gonna make the decisions and we just want them to be as well informed and civically engaged in all of these things and want them to know about the browsers and the deep fakes and, and things of that nature um, and let them decide whether they want to disengage. I've had students that disengage completely 
and others that say, I'm going to continue spending eight hours on Twitter, but at least I know that there are bots and things and, and, and things of that nature. Hi, Nicole. Lisa Hinchliffe, University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, coordinator for information literacy services in the University Library. Always great when we have somebody in the iSchool who's working on these same issues. We don't always have someone. <laughs> um, so I'm wondering if you could reflect a little bit about strategies for um, when you're teaching, especially in these shorter time sessions that you've been talking about, where you don't accidentally push people over into the abyss of skepticism, of cynicism. Because that seems to me particularly a danger in our 50 minute sessions. That we raise so much um, suspicion. That, oh, you have to think about this, you have to think about this. And the takeaway message isn't, I'm going to be a critical thinker. The takeaway message is, I can trust nothing, so I'm just going to believe whatever I believe. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if, if you don't have an idea in the 50 minute, I'm just wondering if you can even reflect on, as, you, as you've seen students tipping towards that abyss of cynicism, which may or may not be worse than the problem of absolute trust, but it's certainly problematic, right? What are our strategies for sort of harnessing them and pulling them away from cynicism as the other emotional end of um, believing everything, right? Going to Aristotle's, a good is the, you know, the mean between two not goods, right? Yeah, thank you. Um, for me, my thought to that is some of this is a, is a pedagogy issue, right? So when I teach, whether it was the one shot or whether it's in my semester long classes, every class starts with an agenda. And I try really hard not to give them more than three points. Um, and then at the end, we review those three points. And you know, similar to what I was saying in one of the previous questions about the Vancouver Kiss couple, I don't inundate with examples. I say to them, you know, if you want more, I have more, right? Or I can refer you or, you know, give you more information. But I think some of this um, is really about avoiding the information overload, right? They're already experiencing informa information overload from every place else in their life. They don't necessarily need it from us, too. Um, but I think, pedagogically speaking, this idea of trying to give information in chunks and just kind of you know, have a good discussion about one thing as opposed to having, you know, a very rushed or scattered conversation about eight, right? And then they leave not necessarily knowing, they know nothing about nothing, right? Um, but I think some of that is gonna be how we structure whether we're doing a one shot or a semester long. So at least, you know, to my faculty colleague um, where I have 16 weeks, I do that every session. But then I do have the luxury of going back, say, the next week and maybe giving them another example. Or I can go back you know, at the end of a, of a unit and say, let's pull all these things together. So you might not be able to do that in the one shot, but you can structure it in such a way that perhaps you, know, you can have conversation without overloading them to the point where they just avoid everything that you said. said about um, your students not being able to maybe reach that cognitive level of what you're talking about because the emotions stay in play. And so as a teacher, how do you, do you have any strategies for getting them to emotionally, I don't know, trust you or feel confident or whatever to get to them that cognitive level? Yeah, so my answer to that really doesn't, doesn't necessarily have anything to do with fake news. It's just more of a kind of critical self-reflection that I do as an instructor. Um, and we can talk later, I can give you articles and things. Um, but just to say that I had a little bit of a crisis of conscience in my teaching maybe about two or three years ago um, because I felt like we weren't moving from theory to practice, right? So we were talking about these concepts and they're like, yeah, I got it, I got it, I got it. And they had a real life example and it was crickets. And I said, but we talked about this. And they're like, we did? Because it, they weren't, it wasn't, the, the, they weren't looking at their knowledge and skills as transferable, right? So I took it out of context for them. 
So then when I had to go back and kind of critically reflect on how I was interacting with them as a, as a instructor, I give, I tell more stories. Um, I talk probably incessantly about context. Um, I give examples all of the time about, okay, so we're talking about this particular concept. Um, this is how I used it you know, in the workplace, or I used it in this library, or I used it that way. Um, and really trying to take a step back and give as many examples and try and actually, um, for lack of better phrasing, manually make these connections. Because um, again, I think part of it is the overload. I'm throwing so much at them um, particularly if it's a class that's a little heavier on theory, how do I actually make these connections to what they view as a very practical job and profession? So really kind of, I had to stop assuming that they were making these connections even if they had told me they had. Um, so it was really just kind of slowing down um, and talking more about context. Um, and, and you know, part of that is that, um, to your point about developing that rapport and that trust, right? So if I told them um, I didn't like this class when I took it as a student, um, or this didn't work for me and this is how I screwed up in my first job, right? So not to kind of you know compare stories, but just to kind of relay that human element. So I don't know if that helps, but that was kind of my approach for trying to work on that. Yeah. Nicole, as a follow-up to the question about emotions, oh. Are there any strategies that you use in maybe that one-shot session to gauge where the emotions of the students that you were teaching were at? Mm -hmm. um, you can see how building rapport over the course of the semester, that's a little bit easier to yeah. do when you have a relationship. Any ideas as to how you approach that in the one-shot environment? I have thought a lot about this, especially when I was doing the one shots, um, and I have been to all of the programs, you know, where people give tips and tricks, and I would try them, and some didn't work for me, and others did work, and I would have to kind of do trial and error. Like I know a lot of people that will, you know, actually greet students um, as they come into the room, which I adore that idea. That's just not for the introvert in me. That, you know. Um, <laughs> It's just like, ooh, people. Um, <laughs> there, you know, I'm, I have other colleagues who play music when folks come in. Um, I, I did that for a while, um, but depending on the kind of music, they would be like, what are you doing? <laughs> right, so like, it's, it's trial and error, but I think it's, you know, is there a way that you can identify that works for you and your style that you can immediately present to them that I'm human, I'm not just this person being wrote about these are the three steps for EBSCO, right? So, you know, for me it was trial and error. Um, I would go from table to table, and just, you know, when I was passing things out, I would say, how, how are you today, and that kind of thing. So, you know, I'm not like shining the spotlight on them. How do you feel today? Um, but just to kind of, you know, get that immediate interaction um, so you're not just like the talking head. So I don't have as, as great an answer for that, but these were some of the things that I would think about and, and that I would try. I am Michael Floral, uh, Purdue University. Um, I, I'd like to say fake news was made popularized by Donald Trump. Alternative facts, the first thing I think of when I see that is Kellyanne, Con Kellyanne Conway. Mm -hmm. I think your argument is to not use these terms because it goes us to this negative emotional state where we're currently fractured. And that we need to, we can say malinformation or disinformation and then that kind of detracts of that I don't want to say it contributes to solves, but perhaps addresses the emotional aspect of it. I guess my concern about this, I'd like to hear your perspective, is that's not like students will be seeing fake news in the context of politics. And your examples are divorced from that pedagogically for a sound reason to try to get you know these very intense polarizing emotions out of the equation. Um, but students will be encountering fake news in political contexts on um, Instagram. I think they're not using Facebook anymore. That's what I've been told. So, <laughs> are they back? Okay. I'm kidding, they're back. Okay. So, I guess they're in the real world. They're they're encountering fake news on Facebook, and we all are, alternative facts, etc. So, 
Given that, have you done like a real world exercise where they check out their own Facebook feeds to determine fake news or I guess what would be your argument against that pushback to say, well, that's, that's great, but that's not what they're doing in the real world. They're not talking about malinformation, they're talking about fake news. So I'm not saying not to use the words, I'm saying to use them in context. And I'm saying to explain what it is and talk about what they see every day and, and how they feel about it, and then bring it into the larger context to hopefully enhance understanding about it. So I'm saying that fake news and alternative facts, it minimizes the conversation, right? I'm not saying that they don't see it. I'm not saying that you shouldn't use it. I'm saying that this is, I prefer to use fake news and alternative facts as an entryway to a larger conversation. So in terms of exercises, I mean, there's any number of exercises. I mean, in the teaching that I do, I can't have them on Facebook while I'm teaching, right? So I, I, that's not a particular exercise that I would do. But, but just to say, you know, you heard me explain the Vancouver Kiss Couple, and there's all of these different exercises that can allow us to go from this entry point of fake news and alternative facts and expand the conversation into miss, dis, and mal. Now, they may not go back to their dorm or wherever they're going back to and say, oh, let's talk about malinformation tonight over dinner, right? But when they're, the next time they have a conversation about fake news, hopefully they'll have a little bit more understanding of how to address it and interact with it. Like, I, I'm not saying, again, to restrict anything because we know that doesn't work, right? If I tell them you can't use fake news, that's exactly what they're gonna do. I'm just saying we shouldn't be using these terms in isolation. Thank you. I guess I can throw out a comment. I, I think also as we're talking about the emotional side, the affective side, we're often talking about, as pointed out, the, um, the desire to overcome those intense emotions on those charged topics. But there's also a lot of research that shows if someone is emotionally neutral, there's also pitfalls that students can run into with that, right? Yeah. So like number one is the um, first thing you hear on the topic you don't care that much about becomes outsized in all the other information you hear. And that sets the groundwork for how you understand this new, this new thing. And so when a lot of students are really neutral or just don't care about topics that we think are important, then they also, fall into a lot of strange knowledge or misinformation and that kind of stuff. So it's not just the highly charged topics I think that we have to be aware of, but also the ones that are not highly charged. Right. Or maybe topics that should be highly charged but aren't. Like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I mean, if you don't really care about something, like is there a, a point at which you say enough, I don't want to hear any more about this, you might not. And so then you're, perhaps you're opening yourself up to be even more inundated if you have that neutral or indifferent stance, for sure. How are we on time? It's like the classroom if we wait longer. <laughs> Kali is going to be nice because she's one of my former students. <laughs> so I work with students with uh, archival sources. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you have, you know, maybe a quick comment or a, a brief point about fake news and uh, or alternative facts specifically when working with students, uh, teaching them archival literacy. Mm -hmm. Would it be something that when you were, depending on what resources or what collections you're using, is it something that you can mention propaganda or yellow journalism or is it something that you can actually explicitly tie back to a period or an instance that was related to? Well, so I'm thinking specifically like we have collections uh, that have to do with anti-slavery. Mm -hmm. So, thank you. <laughs> uh, we have collections, so for me, so you're speaking about, you know, instructors but then also students. So for me, I'm thinking about reflecting on the first time that I taught with some of our anti-slavery pamphlets and how 
I sort of struggled in that first session to communicate what I was supposed to be communicating in the instruction session because I had, I was having this. You were having the, yes, okay, right, reaction. okay. And then also too, you know, I see online and on Twitter, um, there is sort of this encroaching thing uh, happening. Um, and a lot of historians, mm -hmm. granted, are really combating a lot of the disinformation uh, using archival mm -hmm. sources mm -hmm. and um, secondary sources that they've done their own sort of research on. But I'm starting to see that sort of encroachment on even sort of historical sources and primary source material. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you just have yeah, that's a hard one because I think some of this um, comes down to interpretation. So I'm thinking about, I can't remember who it was that said that slavery was like indentured servitude and then someone else said that they liked slavery. It was just a job for them. They came over willingly, right? So I think it gets harder because people could be looking at the same information and have completely different interpretations, whether it's malicious or not. Um, Right, so we yeah. had, for example, we had, I, I think it was the um, sort of uh, elementary school level publisher, Macmillan. Yes. They had posted. Or Pearson, you know, they, one of the two. Right, yeah. exactly. Yeah. They had published in one of their textbooks even that it was indentured servitude right. and there was a big uproar about right. that. Right, right. Yeah, no, I, I mean, if I'm hearing your question correctly, at least the base of it in terms of your emotions as an instructor, right? Conveying that information. Um, yeah, that's a hard one. I mean, it, there, there are instances where I can skip over things because I have the luxury of time and I'm not worrying about, I'm not trying to use a specific collection. Because um, it's, it's not gonna work for me to tell you to use another collection, right? right. Um, <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I mean, you know, I mean, an approach would be, and I think it might depend on how comfortable you are, is to tell them you're uncomfortable. Okay, yeah. Right? This is an uncomfortable topic. Right. Um, and I think, you know, you and Caitlin and some of my other students who have taken other classes with me might remember me saying, you know, if we're talking about privilege or one of the other topics, I'm going to tell you I'm as uncomfortable with this topic as you are, um, but we need to talk about it, and this is why. Um, and then, you know, maybe you don't talk about it as long, or maybe you give a different example, or, you know, I had to do talks about um, being bullied online and things of that nature. And so just as a, an example, I've had to move away from describing my own experience, and I get permission from other people to talk about their experience, right? So I think it might be, you know, how you might approach it and what information you leave out, how you preface it, what context you give around it. Um, but if it makes you that uncomfortable, I might tell them that because that might lead to another conversation about why this collection is difficult to use, but it makes that collection even more valuable. Thanks, Literacy Summit. Um, thanks for your insightful talk and for taking all of our questions. This has been a great conversation and I'm excited to have got a lot of things in mind as we move into the breakout sessions for today. So we have a small gift uh, for you on Thank behalf you. of the um, organizing committee and we, we appreciate your time. Thank, Thank you. you. Good to be here. Thank you.